Welcome everyone to the first installment of the IKNS Conversations That Matter series for this academic year. Uh, we're very excited that all of you have been able to join us tonight. My name is Michael Karboyak and I'm the Associate Director of Columbia's Master of Science Program in Information and Knowledge Strategy, or fondly known as IKNS. Uh, I can see that there are a number of new faces in the crowd, so I'll take a minute to introduce the IKNS program before introducing our esteemed guests for the evening. Columbia's IKNS program was one of the first graduate degrees offered by the University School of Professional Studies. Uh, the genesis of this program stemmed from Columbia's pioneering role in library and information sciences over 10 years ago. Today, the degree is, found, is grounded in the academic discipline of knowledge management, focusing on, on the intangible assets of organizations, such as business intelligence, organizational knowledge, intellectual property, human capital, organizational culture, and networks with partners and customers. Since the launch of this program, the world has seen a remarkable proliferation in knowledge-driven organizations and an unprecedented rise in the role of knowledge workers in today's economy. It's recently been estimated that there are, over that there are now over a billion knowledge workers in the global economy. And as is evident by the many Zoom meetings on all of our calendars daily, the digital workplace is here to stay. Tonight, we are happy to have the opportunity to bring the ICANN's community together to look back on the past decade and to hear from two of the preeminent thought leaders in the knowledge management community. I should mention at this point that this event originally was planned as a conversation between Nancy Dixon and Tom Stewart, another prominent speaker in the field. Uh, unfortunately, due to a last minute circumstance, Tom is not able to join us tonight. However, we are incredibly fortunate to have Larry Prusak here in Tom's place. Larry is a leading researcher, author, and consultant specializing in the fields of knowledge and learning. He's currently the, the director of research for Knowledge Solutions LLC and a beloved lecturer in the IKNS program. I've heard rumors that there's a running list of Larryisms that circulates through our student body, uh, and I'd love to get a copy of that and publish it someday. Uh, but jokes aside, Larry is a fountain of insight, and Larry is already set to be published this coming summer. Uh, Larry's next book, The Smart Mission, co-authored with fellow ICANS lecturer Ed Hoffman and published by the MIT Press, will be on shelves. Will be on shelves in August 2022. Joining Larry this evening is Nancy Dixon, an equally celebrated consultant, writer, and speaker. Nancy also teaches with us in the ICANS program and played a major role in the development of the program's independent research course. Nancy has written eight books and over 80 articles on the subject of knowledge management, and her most current work focuses on how organizations can use dialogue to tackle their most challenging problems. For those of you who have heard through tonight's event through KM World, Nancy will be a familiar face to you all as she has led over a dozen presentations at the KM World conferences and will be leading uh, KM 101 this session this year at this year's convening in November. We're all we're so delighted to have the ability to bring these two minds together uh, for what will certainly be a rich conversation tonight. Please join me in welcoming both Nancy and Larry to the so to speak main stage for tonight's event. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's a lovely introduction. Much appreciated. All right, we are, we're by ourselves now, Larry, so <laughs> we can proceed. So I wanted us to start um, with saying sort of who were the people that influenced our thinking, not necessarily around knowledge management so much, but just our thinking in general. And then we, we, we'll go to the idea of who, who's influenced KM. So you start and then I'll, I'll follow. Well, I started life as a, a pro, wanting to be a professor in the history of ideas and took the history of ideas PhD program at NYU and then studied in England for a year. In terms of individuals who influenced me in general, uh, outside of Groucho Marx, <laughs> I, I, Isaiah Berlin would be one I certainly would mention. Uh, Clifford Gertz, a uh, cultural anthropologist, that's a good question. James March, who I think is the best, greatest uh, management theorist in the 20th century at Stanford. Um, a lot of, I've read, I've sort of a bit of a polymath. I read everything, economics and history and biography. And uh, I find management books a little less interesting, to be honest, <laughs> unless they're really outstanding, like Peter Drucker. But, or, but do, or, you still, do you still read some knowledge management or some management books? If they're really, yeah, if they're published, they're really good. If I read reviews, they say this is really original. Uh, 
actually there aren't that many original books you know knowledge uh, management yeah. isn't exactly a science so people keep reinventing things but yeah sure i read amy edmondson's new book i i read Ta nasim nasim talib the man who wrote the black swan i'd read his books mm. he's a real thinker yeah a few other people i could name so there's like four or five if they bring out a book i buy it and read it but a lot of it is just rep repetitious how to be a leader in eight different ways i mean things like that yeah, I saw the other day, um, I was looking up um, leadership. I've, I was actually writing a blog post on, um, on we need to be thinking more about members rather than leaders. But I, so I looked up and there's been 4 billion books that have leadership in the title. Yeah, uh, can you believe that? And, and, and yet we don't know how to do leadership. I once said, you know, it's like if someone wanted to write a great book. It could be called Lincoln's Doctor's Dog. It would sell. <laughs> But generally, if, if there's so many books on leadership, how many of us have actually met a great leader in business, in work? Not too many. So something yeah. is askew there. But it's those definitely are askew. Thinkers. That's right. That's right. Thinkers. I also read a lot in Greek classics. I, I really like Aristotle. So I'm a fan of his. Yeah. So so very reading very widely, which, which I think comes out in conversations with you. And I know it comes out in the classes, too. But my influences were, um, well, I started out thinking about learning and um, I initially I started thinking about training and then I discovered that training just doesn't do much in organizations, doesn't, you know, you know, the, the, the whole idea that only 10% of what you learn in training ever gets put into place is, is true and discouraging. And, but my focus initially was and my focus has always been around social learning. I've always been interested in learning itself. And I was greatly influenced by Chris Arger's, um, when, uh When I first taught at the university, at the University of Texas, um, uh, our little tiny faculty of five people wanted to have a research focus and we decided it would be Ardress's work. And so he came and worked with the faculty uh, and we worked with he and uh, two of his students who since are carrying out his work um, for about two years. And, and then we wound up with lots of dissertation students writing, you know, influence, writing things based on artists' work. But he, he was a great influence on me. The val underlying values of his work were really important. Um, and then the other person, and this was still while I was at UT, um, was Reg Revens, which I don't think anybody else probably knows. But do you know yeah, his name? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, I really was taken with his idea of action learning, which is not what people do in the United States with action learning. But so I went and spent three summers. Every time I had, you know, I'd teach in the fall and spring, and then I'd have summer off, and I'd, I'd go to England and I'd study with him. So I talked with him, and and he told a story that that is just has been so uh, impactful to me. He was in, in the night, late middle 1930s, he was at the Cavendish lab in Cambridge and as a doctoral student. And at the time, there were five people who, who either were or would become Nobel Prize winners in physics. And so, you know, Rutherford, Rutherford who talked about the structure of the atom, um, Mark Oliphant around, you know, who invented microwave radar, um, uh, Walton that looked at the new, the, how you would do the nuclear particle accelerator, these huge number of people. And, and the story he told was that he said uh, every Wednesday that Rutherford would have a high tea like they do in England. And, uh, and these five Nobel Prize winners would come and, and to the meeting. And a few doctoral students got to come, not very many, but a few, and, and Revens was one of them. And, and he said that uh, Rutherford had this rule that you could not talk about your successes. You had to talk about a problem that you had that you'd not been able to solve or a failure that you'd had. And then the others would, would think with you about, you know, what, what could have caused the failure, what could have gone wrong. So this idea of having this cognitive diversity of these great minds dealing with problems just has stuck with me forever. That is, you know, and Revan said he was so impacted by the humility of these great men. And they were all men, of course, the great men that, that, uh, that were willing to speak about failure 
and, and to be helped by their colleagues, which was really sort of just amazing. So he was a great influence on me. I, I should mention one more, and that's uh, at the same time I was at the University of Texas, Carl Weick was teaching there. He later went to Michigan, but he was there for a while. And he all, his work also has had a great influence on me around sense making, so. Yes, I like him also. Yeah. He's, he's another one whose who's, who's book you would read if he published a new one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. He's, been, he's a great thinker. Yeah. All right. So um, our task, I think, as we set it out, Larry, is to think about um, where, where KM came from. So what were the origins? Who were the people that influenced it initially? So what, what's your list of initial influences? You already talked about March. And so I bet he's one of them. Actually, I, yeah, I think in terms of knowledge, focusing on knowledge, Peter Drucker, who's the biggest influence on me, uh, I think he, again, like March, is one of the very few management thinkers who could really be called a thinker and whose books are still worth reading long after he died. Um, he invented, didn't he? He first one to really popularize knowledge work and knowledge workers. It's the very first. He didn't live long enough to, uh, talk about knowledge management. I was always disappointed. I wanted to send him my book and things like that, but he died. Uh, he was very sweet, very mod talk about a modest man. Davenport and I went into interview him once. He lives in a small house in a suburb of Los Angeles. And there's a lot of books, but it was for a man of that influence, pretty surprising. But um, he was a wonderful man and he really helped set this movement in place. Others who influenced me, um, Jiro Nonaka, who wrote really the first serious yes. book, knowledge management. I became friends with, I still am friends with him. And uh, I was deeply influenced by, I read that book. I said, wow, that's exactly right. Someone really, and Oxford published it. And it really um, gave me a, like an adrenaline shot that really has lasted the rest of my career. Uh, Jim March, Ken Arrow, the Nobel prize winning economist was really, he, he was very close to talking about knowledge. He conflated it with information, unfortunately, but he was the one who really did a lot of the research on when we were building ships, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor, our fleet was destroyed. We had to quickly rebuild the fleet. And a lot of research was at the Rand Institute. I don't know if they called it Rand then, where the second ship a crew built was always done faster than the first crew because they learned by experience. And he began to think about that subject. What is it they learned? How did they learn? By working together, it's sort of like what you're social learning, what you're talking about, Nancy. So Ken Arrow's won it. Recently, Paul Romer, who won the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics and put knowledge on the map. I'm always, he, uh, he didn't say anything that was remarkably prescient to me and the other researchers, but he proved it mathematically. And that's the new plus ultra in America, or probably world academics. And he got the Nobel Prize for it. So it gave us certain a cognitive authority to the subject of knowledge. You can no longer say, oh, it's a fad. It's just stuff people talk about. It's not a real thing. Boom, he got the Nobel Prize. So that was a really important, uh, that was a really important event. As I've read all the other, I mean, there's tons of people. Uh, Max Boisseau is another one I've been very influenced mm -hmm. by, an English theorist, did quite a bit of writing on this. Uh, I could go, I, mean, I have a whole room here behind me of books on this subject, but those are probably the main influences on yeah. me in terms of this subject. What about you? Yeah. Uh, well, I think I'd, I would include Bandura um, yeah. around social learning. Uh, you know, you know he, he, he was convinced that, I think before he started writing, if you wanted to talk about knowledge, you were talking about something that was in a book. And you know, or in an article, and and he said, no, we learn from other people. We learn from uh, observing. We learn from talking. We learn from imitating, and that that was that was very influential. Uh, it, you know, and he was early on uh, one of those people. Yeah, and and I don't know that 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 I would say Gary Klein probably wasn't early on, but he he certainly influenced the field as well. I think uh, uh, around his his thinking. Yeah, I'd, I'd be really curious to know, you know, the people that are listening to us, how many of them have, have, have had the opportunity to read those books. So in your classes, do, do, do you, would you have them read March? Would you have them read I saw, some of the I, I March is too much, but I do assign David T. Some, 
dynamic capabilities. He's a professor at Berkeley. Uh, now we just, I try to raise the level. I mean, when I was in college, I'd sometimes, I took a course with a teacher assigned some pretty difficult reading. He said, stretch, stretch yourself. <laughs> I think that's a good thing to do. Uh, yeah. Things that are really difficult, plow through it, do you know, try it. It's really worth doing and you won't slide back. But yeah, yeah. I would definitely, it, March might be able to, but I certainly would sign Drucker's stuff. Everyone does. I mean, that's- And, and Nanakis, would you assign yeah. Nanakis yeah. books? Yeah, some of his articles, definitely. Ed and I assigned some of his articles and uh, David Tease, a couple of, uh, uh, Amy Edmondson, we assigned her articles. So things yeah. like that, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, there, there have been some really important people that have thought about knowledge. Well, let, let's turn to the, oh, well, I was just gonna say one thing about Drucker and you, you mentioned that, that one of the definitions he has for a knowledge worker is a knowledge worker is a person whose task that he has responsibility for knows more about it than his boss does. <laughs> I think it's a, <laughs> but, but given the speed of knowledge, I mean, that's what happens, isn't it? You want to know something interesting about Drucker that I bet you didn't know? What? His childhood closest friend was Michael Polanyi. Is was, that right? Yeah, they were both Hungarian Hungarian Jews in Vienna, and uh, they were very they were very close. He knew the whole family. Karl Polanyi, who's a very interesting political economist, and Michael, who really popularized and did a lot of work on tacit knowledge, but he was a childhood friend of his. I, he told me, I was really surprised, but wow, took yeah. the whole world. Vienna produced an enormous amount of great thinkers at one time. Yeah, but, but we, and we didn't mention Pagliani, but of course yeah. we should have because he's- true. Yeah, he's a little hard to we, read. I wouldn't assign him to students. He's a little very Germanic, but- uh. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let us turn to, um, to thinking about the uh, sort of where KM has been, yeah. and, uh, and and then maybe to where it's going. But let's talk about where it's been. And and I wrote, it's, I've written several articles on the sort of the three eras of knowledge management. And you and I know you're thinking too. So you start. What what's the first era of knowledge management? Well, I think you know I was there at the present at the creation. I think Dean Atchison wrote a book called that. Uh, Tom Stewart played a role in that actually along with uh, the early 90s many of us began to think and I can answer you and quite a few other people I could name that information was not enough to give an organization a competitive edge even if you got the right there used to be a thing you get the right information to the right person at the right time you'd enter nirvana the promised land but most firms could do that that's not that hard to do and I hired two economists at MIT. I was working in an Ernst & Young's uh, R&D unit then. And they said, you might get like 10 to 12% productivity enhancement by having the right information go to the right person, the right legal information <laughs> go to the right person at the right time. So I, Davenport and I both were working at Ernst & Young at the time. And we began to think, if it's not information, what differentiates firms? Luck, brains, seems that brains were pretty evenly distributed. And reading Drucker and talking about this, um, we were having tea at the Boston Athenaeum. I, I said to him, or well, he said to me, we still can't figure out who did it. I bet it's knowledge, which is different than information. And I said, let's look into that. So both of us began to really read a lot about knowledge and we couldn't find much. We plenty in philosophy and in other fields, but we couldn't find hardly any in management except for Drucker and a few other people. So we began to try to popularize the word. And then Tom Stewart did a great service to the thing. He wrote a cover story in Fortune magazine called The New World of Intellectual Capital. Cover story, he quoted me, quoted other people in the field. And wow, I got uh, literally a hundred phone calls in the next few days. What is intellectual capital? What are you talking about? I stayed up you know, half the night trying to answer these this pre-email. And we, had, we held the first conference on the subject, again, Ian Y, Ernst & Young in Boston. And we thought we'd get 20, 30 people. We got over 200, it was at the Four Seasons in Boston. We had to turn people away. And Dorothy Leonard, who was interested in this, she spoke, Chris Bartlett, another Harvard HBS professor, he spoke. And you could sense people writing about it and people talking about it. The wheel began to move, the circ people got interested in knowledge, although, 
I had consultants at Ernst & Young say, what are you talking about knowledge? You know, don't mention that to our clients. They'll throw you out of the room. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. So it took a <laughs> while. They hated that. They thought it was the same thing as information. One of the great push, Sisyphusian tasks of pushing the boulder up the hill is getting people to understand they are different things. Information is not the same thing as knowledge. And that's been one of the huge tasks. That's one of the reasons knowledge management and everything associated with it has been so slow to be put into the curriculum. People don't understand what it is. I'd say that's the biggest obstacle. So the first generation of knowledge management really was information management with the word knowledge attached to it. Taxonomies, documents, librarians, which is fine, but it proved to be, it couldn't, um, what's the right word? It couldn't cut the mustard as we used to say back in Brooklyn. It couldn't, uh, wasn't strong enough. Hmm. So that generation died a little because a lot of, a lot of the people tried things. They did, they were sold all sorts of junk by consultants, you know, enterprise knowledge systems. I, it was just gigantic sales efforts for technology, taxonomies, and they said it was very, very, uh, it was just documents. No one talked about know-how. No one talked about social learning. The stuff that we believe in and many other researchers, believe me, uh, was just never mentioned. Sorry, that's the first generation. <laughs> yeah, um, when, when, I, when I wrote my book, which came out like a year after yours or whatever, uh, 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 Ernst & Young um, sponsored it and provided me the the yep. money to go to England and uh, you know uh, look at BP. Tom, Tom and I actually played a role in that, Nancy. Did you really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I have you to thank. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Oh, that, I'm so sure. glad to know that. Yeah, we had we had money to burn. They gave us a lot of money, and I yeah to find the yeah. right outlets for it. And you were one of them. That was that's great. Yeah, but but I think one of the things that went wrong. It absolutely it was the. It was this focus on databases and trying to collect all the information. But I think the big consulting firms had a big role to play in that because oh. they wanted to sell something yeah, and what absolutely. they could sell was collecting all this knowledge. What they thought was knowledge. Absolutely, they, they, absolutely. Coca-Cola had a contract with IBM, with uh, Ernst & Young, some enormous amount of money. I mean, at the time, a couple of million dollars to manage their knowledge. And I said, what are you doing? I mean, I asked the consultant, how are you doing this? We can't figure out exactly how to do it. Said, it's all databases. I said, God, I feel like writing a letter to the board saying, save your money, you're crazy. This is not knowledge. And a Chrysler tried to manage. They had a thing called the book of knowledge. They wanted to capture. I remember, yeah. Capture all the knowledge. This is a giant firm. <laughs> Capturing that knowledge would be something from Isaac Asimov or you know, War of the World, H.G. Wells. It couldn't possibly be done. <laughs> They paid a lot of money to consultants to do this. And of course, nothing happened. So we wrote a case about it, actually. But that generation died out and a new generation emerged. And, and, and at the end of that generation, we, we heard KM was dead. Do you yes, remember? Exactly. Yeah, KM I, was I, dead. I began to think it was dead because we couldn't get the argument across. But it wasn't dead. Yeah. The whole global economy was moving towards knowledge. So it can't die. No one could say that this is a, a dead subject when... I don't know what, I keep trying to find the ex number, but OECD and the World Bank estimate that, you know, maybe something like 40% of the entire global output is based on knowledge services and knowledge products. So yeah. it's hard to say a sub subject is dead if they're focused. It would be like saying agriculture is dead in the agricultural age. I mean, it just, it doesn't yeah. make sense. So a second- Yeah, but it was sure talked about. Yeah, we All did. All right, so move us, move us to the second, second era. Well, that was one, that began to move away from the individual's knowledge and the enterprise knowledge to right. some aggregate. Communities, networks, practices, some aggregate which you can use as yeah. a unit of analysis, which makes a lot of sense. It still makes a lot of sense. So we got away from the road warrior, you know, all his knowledge or her knowledge is in a laptop that we're typing away, or the enterprise, which is just a fantasy. So we got, that was one big change. Another and, one, and the idea of ta tacit knowledge became yeah, really important. Absolutely, I prefer the now. I use the word know how and know what. But you're right. Tacit knowledge began to. No knockers book really helped on this. I don't know how many people really read it, but it certainly ideas became very, very common. Tacit and explicit right. and stuff like that. 
and there was a reflourishing, a, a resurgence, you might say. Many books were published, many articles, journals appeared, con conferences were regularly attended. So it was pretty, uh, it was pretty, that second generation really, what's the right word, turned the corner, focusing yeah. on aggregates, focusing on tacitness as well as explicit, less technology oriented and more oriented in learning and how people have know-how. So I think that was and a John, John Seeley Brown with um, yeah. Social Life of Information was a big influence. And, and I think Winger's book was, yeah. was such a yeah, big absolutely. influence. Yes, thank you. Etienne Venn, you're for the audience sometimes if you remember the names of these books or give them their full name. I see people in chat are asking who are these people, so. Uh, oh, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> we ought to, we ought to, when this is over, we ought to produce a list of everyone we've talked about. We could, we could, we could do that. Yeah, but but I think I think uh, Antine Winger uh, writing about uh, communities of practice huge influence is was just really influential. Absolutely, no question about it. He really is one of the uh, founders, you might say. And then there were research consortiums. Tom Davenport and I ran. We ran one at Ernst and Young. Then I ran one at IBM. Then we ran one at Babson College, and we had like sixty or seventy members, including Ed Hoffman from NASA people from the large, really large firms globally, and they spread the word, you might say. We began to do research and the word became our academia caught on. But quite a few people began teaching. I mean, a big, you know, Nonaka's partner, Takeuchi got it. He was teaching at the Harvard Business School, gave a course with Mike Porter on knowledge-based strategies as well as economic-based strategies. And Berkeley started a school in information science. Uh, the Columbia experience came a little bit later, but. More, and in Asia really picked up I, to say the Asian countries are very amenable to learning about knowledge, maybe more so than the United States. And Germany was a hot subject too, as well as the UK. So it really picked up. That was really the turning point where it wouldn't go backwards. Some people say, oh, it's another fad, you know. I said, well, they said like quality. Quality wasn't a fad, it just got embedded in the way we work. Some things are fads, needless to say, but knowledge couldn't be a fad. I mean, it's like saying, I don't know, accounting is a fad. It just, it's always going to be with you and people are always going to look for ways to work more efficiently. I think that's right. And and, and one of the things that I think has, has, and that was the beginning also of people working more in teams, that teams became the unit of work and the, and the unit of research, if you were doing research. Yeah. And so that then conversation became more important. Absolutely. And how people interacted with each other became really critical. Spaces too, and you you would agree with that. You know, creating spaces, cognitive spaces, social spaces, physical spaces, spaces where people can talk and exchange knowledge. That Japanese term ba b a a that Nonaka popularized, a place where common meaning is developed yes. by conversation. That really caught on, and it's still it's still a very valuable concept to be. Um, you need spaces, various types of spaces, but you need spaces for knowledge really occurs in the spaces between people. I feel that's- I cool. think that's right. That's a good way to say it. That's where it occurs, but in the spaces between people. Yeah. All right, let's, where, where is it now? I mean, we, we, didn't, we didn't really end that second le level because there's still, no. communities are still the oh, main absolutely. thing. Absolutely, no. And, but where are we now with, with the, what's the third era? I, when I wrote about it, I said it was about ideas, but you have a different name for it. Well, I'm not sure what I, I was thinking about that all day since you said we're going to be talking about this. I think one of the big things that's going to be happening in knowledge is that AI is sort of trying to come into the knowledge sphere. AI cannot do knowledge. It can do reckoning. Remarkably fast, remarkably just remarkable reckoning, but that's not judgment, it's not insight, it's not understanding, and it's not meaning. Knowledge gives meaning to information. Data can't do that, and AI can't do that. And I think as AI, which is a wonderful subject, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a Luddite at all, but it as that occurs, firms and organizations are beginning to figure out what do we need? What did people, what can people contribute to the firm's operations? by their knowledge and judgment, what can AI do? And you're gonna get terrific, already I've been to a few of these, really a lot of, um, great deal of discussion 
and understanding there's tons of books coming out on these things. Some people are pure technophiles, others saying, no, it's just you know another fad, but it's not another fad. It's just a different subject. But we have to really guard against trying to, what's the right word? Financialize knowledge or make it into a technology rather than actually think of it as a human attribute, a collective human attribute. I'm thinking of this third era as one in which knowledge is being is being used for innovation, that you were bringing people together. And, and instead of just trying to understand the problems and figure them out, we're now trying to create innovations. And it's knowledge that does that. Absolutely. No question. I, I just, again, I love using technologies in some ways. I'm very happy about this. But I, uh, I think the only, you know, you need people to do these things. I'm sold on the human element in knowledge. I just don't think there's any, maybe in the far future, who knows? It's not my job to figure that out. Ask Isaac Asimov or people like that, dig him up and ask him. Mm -hmm. But for us, I think we should really stick to what do people know? How do you use what people know? How do you set an environment where people can communicate, just what you're talking about, and have dialogue? And can create new knowledge. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and it is the environment that because there's two things I think, uh, that's been happening that's influenced this third era if there is one and and one is this idea of distributed work and even before the the pandemic we begin to do distribute teams begin to work together that were distributed around the world so this whole idea of being distributed and yet being able that brings diversity that brings cultural differences it's been, it's been wonderful i mean they have a lot of trouble doing it but it's been wonderful that that and and and, and then I think, and, and then the, I think we, we learn more about how do we convene conversations, which is sort of dialogue in the, in the, in the area that I'm interested How do we bring people together in a way that they in fact can learn from each other? I think it's, there's real interest uh, about that. Well, you know, it used to be firms were called lean, tough fighting machines. You know, this sort of stupid stuff that Jack Welch and others began to propagate, but firms are not machines. You need people. A machine just needs fuel and it's a good mechanic. People really need incentives. They need spaces. They need spaces to think and discuss. And we really, uh, firms that do that well. I mean, I recently, there's a fellow who teaches in this program from Google, a uh, really nice guy. And he gave us a tour of the Google New York facility, I think a year ago or two years ago. I forgot when it was. And I was just so impressed. You could almost smell or feel the mental energy of people talking, conversing, figuring things out. It, I don't mean to be a propagandist for Google, but it was really there. I mean, I, it's in the ozone, you might say. And that's what you really should aim for because they'll come out with new products. They'll come out with innovation. It's really fascinating to, uh, to go to that. And other, I'm sure other firms are like doing things like that. I know Michael's gonna stop us in about four or five minutes, but I, I wanna raise one other issue. and and. And that is, so I, is, is this idea of teams to become the unit of work, Edmondson's work and so forth. But also we are tending toward flatter organizations, I think. And that is because it has been so hard for, for um, knowledge on the ground to move up because of all the political power over issues that we have in hierarchy. And it's been very hard for the top to, to create something that makes sense because they don't have enough information coming up. So we, so the flat organization getting flatter, I think is trying to solve that problem. I don't th think we've gotten very far in it yet, but if, but you take, but teams like Google, you know, they did the, one of the, the study with Amy Edmondson and found like, and found that psychological safety, the most effective teams were psychologically safe. That means there was not a lot of hierarchy in there. So you have some thinking about that? Are, is our are organizations getting flatter and is that going to influence this? Well, I don't really, you know, that's a big, big question that <laughs> deserves a lot of research. People are not going to give up power uh, voluntarily. I mean, the people who get Harvard MBAs and run these firms have, you know, I just read yesterday that the uh, average CEO is now up to for over 500 times what an average worker is in many firms. They're not gonna give that up. They're not gonna say, oh yeah, we'll flatten this. We'll get rid of all these EVPs and SVPs. It, um, I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't know, I don't, I mean, evolutionary, you would think it would, 
be the force of evolution, and it might, but I don't think they're going to go quietly. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people who uh, spend a lot of time figuring out ways to justify their spectacular fees and salaries for doing work that could be pushed yes. down low. But yeah, to but see. my thought is that that we that that the knowledge in organizations would be improved if we if they were flatter. No question, because it would the knowledge transaction costs would drop like a stone. No, no question about that. Anything that reduces the tr knowledge transact, the cost of transacting with knowledge would give a firm a great advantage. And some firms know this, some firms work on that, even if they don't call it that. But when you have these giant hierarchies, my God, it's just, I mean, I worked at IBM for eight years. It was just, it was nice in some ways, but awful in others. I mean, it's gigantic levels. You can't talk to this person because you're at this level. I mean, it's just, Stuff that it was made the military look uh, <laughs> look much flatter. I mean, it was really nuts. I don't want to hold them up. A lot of large firms are like that. And, and I want to thank both both you, Larry and Nancy. Uh, it's been a wonderful night, and thank you everybody for attending. So, uh, thank you all again. If uh, anyone has any questions or anything that they'd like to follow up with, you can feel free to email myself or or one of the program representatives. We'd be happy to talk to you.